Hello, everyone. Michael Carlin here with your Capital Markets Outlook. Joined, as always, your friend and ours, Joe Tiber, our partner, our CIO, our guide, our guru. Good, good afternoon, Joe. How are you? Uh, great, Michael. Uh, good to be here. Um, uh, happy fall. I know. That's right. Happy fall. Yeah, for, for those of us you know, in Arizona, it, is, it has been a particularly brutal summer. And uh, fall couldn't come fast enough. So here we are. Um, Let's, you know, between the election and the market and the economy, we, we really have so much to, to dive into, Joe. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an effort to, to vacillate back and forth between the slide deck and, and bringing things to and fro. Again, as, as you're listening, um, I, I want to make sure to remind everyone, email me, contact us, call us, A, with questions, because I do realize that some of the stuff that Joe and I say, um, it's not always common investment speak. So let us know if you've got questions. Uh, if you need the slide deck, I'm happy to send the slide deck out. So, so stay in touch with us and let us know how we can better, better serve, help, and provide and guide you through this process because there's a lot here. So with that, it's, it's never too soon for us, Joe, to, to, to talk about the market decline. And I, I, I thought this was a, a really good place to start. This is one of the charts from Strategus that, uh, that, that you had sent to me recently. And I just want to reiterate the, 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 the strength, the magnitude, and the duration of that market sell-off that we had uh, during COVID. Um, it was amazing, but also subsequent to that, the, the move that we've had higher has also been amazing. And I think what's happening, if, if, if I could be so bold as to describe the attitudes and feelings of all of our clients, is general concern that it's too much, too fast, the economy isn't strong enough, their job market's not there, restaurants and the whole travel industry is still struggling. So, so how could this be? Because we saw the magnitude of that sell-off. We've now seen a subsequent rise of, of equal magnitude, if not greater. So geez, Joe, it's hard, it's hard for people to kind of wrap their head around that, that whole uh, difficult situation. Yeah, I mean, it's, I'll tell you, it, it, how wouldn't it be hard to wrap your head around the largest contraction uh, ever recorded in, in U.S. history that we experienced at the beginning of the year, followed by the largest and quickest uh, quarterly expansion right. in, on record. Uh, and so that the markets mirrored that um, extraordinarily sharp contraction in the S&P 500, followed by a real sharp contraction in the S or, uh, uh, recovery in the S&P 500, yeah. it makes it may actually makes decent sense when you think the economy actually is, uh, you know, looking somewhat like the stock market. Difficult to wrap your head around, no question. Getting in front of itself, I think, is a whole other conversation. Is the market really in front of itself? And that's where I think there's a lot more debate. Yeah, and I think we're gonna we're gonna unpack that. And as always, what we seek to do is we seek to grab the data, parse through the data, provide you the kind of that unbiased look at what's really going on, and then and then be able to make some conclusions from it. A couple of different slides, let me shoot through them. Um, world per capita GDP. So I think this is a really nice historical perspective, but the lowest uh, per world per capita GDP, COVID hit worldwide GDPs to an extent to which we haven't seen since World War II. So uh, it, that, it, an epic and quick, sharp, sharp move down. At the same time, um, particularly for my retired clients, Joe, they're seeing the cost of, of their living, despite what uh, you know, the CPI inflation numbers are saying, and I know we have certain feelings about CPI versus PCE, but, but, look, but look here in the chart. I mean, the price of eggs, the price of you know, eggs uh, from April to July up 28% and lunch meat and bottled water. So a lot of the things that retired folks are using are going up. Obviously, the notable exceptions there would be travel and entertainment. Either they're not spending money there, or to the extent to which they are spending money there, the prices are very depressed. And, and as a result, Joe, I tie these, these three slides together is that we're seeing that there's an inordinate amount of cash on the sidelines. The reason why I like this chart is that it, it shows um, uh, retail money markets. Um, and, and so you're seeing the amount of money that's sitting in retail money markets effectively earning zero at a level greater than where it was in, in, in 2008. I think it's important to note because one, uh, it shows where the mindset of the retail investor is. They're still worried. Two, they missed out on the rally, Joe. 
They missed out on the rally. Money was flooding out of the market into money market while the market was rising. So how do we reconcile this? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a, the age old fear of getting left behind. Yeah. Is, is very supportive. That last chart that you had up on the screen is a very supportive chart from here forward. So back to your initial kind of question, is the market in front of itself? Um, I'd argue that uh, probably not from that perspective, the backdrop of liquidity and the, uh, the amount of money that still needs to find a home, a productive home, a returning home is substantial. It's never you know, at record highs. So very encouraging, actually, from this point forward, uh, just the liquidity backdrop for sure. Yeah, it's the old it's the old contrarian view, but that's one that 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 just that just tends to work and makes a lot of sense continually. Um, I, I, I'm, I hope I don't say this a lot, Joe, but I think this is one of the most important slides. For me, this is probably the most important slide, but let's let's okay. just look at this slide. This slide, uh, what it shows, Joe, to me is is the green line is the trend line for wage, you know, wage growth, wage increases. The blue line is the real wages and real salaries. COVID hits, real wages, real salaries, where people are receiving in wages and salaries goes down. The red line is inclusive of, un of unemployment benefits. And when you add unemployment benefits to the existing wage picture, this shows to me exactly why consumer spending has been able to maintain its strength. It's continued to be strong, although the trend line without any kind of additional government support is starting to go back towards kind of this mean level, which is again, um, not a lot of support from, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the government with, with additional dollars coming to support the unemployment uh, insurance. So with that, Joe, how concerned should we be? Because we can see clearly now, oh, this is why wages were as good as they were because of the unemployment benefit. I can see it graphically. This supported consumer spending. I can see the trend that's coming. And I, I guess, Joe, maybe the better question is, is that if we don't get government support, are we really in the form of a bailout, are we really in difficult spot here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this 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 is a great chart because it, I mean, it paints the picture and it explains why, you know, why we've had five consecutive months of retail uh, sales growth. Why retail sales, which is a really good proxy for how healthy the pocketbook of the consumer is, uh, why we're back not only above pre-COVID levels yeah. of retail sales, but but this month a number just came out this morning for September. Uh, puts us back above where we were in January, coming in as if there was no COVID. So, so you had that big drop in the blue line, um, the stimulus more than made up for it, but it fell off on July 31st. Yeah. Uh, the debate right now, we think that's the biggest, and I know we're going to talk election in a little bit, but it is, it is certainly, um, obviously, anybody who watches the news or, or reads anything, it's certainly probably the biggest um, uh, contingency factor, we think, of the direction of the market uh, from this point forward, because if it's a continued stalemate, that's a big risk to the market. Um, if it's an over strong delivery of stimulus, and, and again, that red line goes back up, that's very constructive for the market. Right, I guess we have to, we and there's nothing else to do for us to other than wait and see. Right. And, and as we're talking about this government intervention, we go back to the charts here and you know what this chart shows is you know, it just just a nice refresher about the the unprecedented policy response that we had but not just here in the united states joe as you know it's across the world and i look at it this chart just throws it through through june 20 from february through june this does this is not fully inclusive of, of everything that was done but just through june 11.3 trillion injected into the worldwide economy the 6.2 trillion that we injected both um, again, with you know the White House all the way through to the Fed, it was um, a total. I'm sorry, you know, grand total of 44% of our GDP, 44% of our GDP in in that short pocket of time. It typically takes what nine to 12 months for that that economic benefit to be felt. We're not through that cycle yet in terms of nine to 12 months, and. Given the amount that has happened and given the amount that has is continued to be thought that's going to be happening soon with additional stimulus. And we don't even know the total impact, Joe. I, it is hard for me not to see continued um, 
economic surprises, given the fact that people are so negative on the stock market, they're so negative in so many different areas, but this, this liquidity injection is so supportive of the economy. Yeah, um, and this is probably, this, this back in March, you'll recall full uh, very well, Michael, which is back in March, this was the number one driver of our view on the stock market. Right. Uh, confidence in the response, both, and this, this is a great chart. This looks at central bank response or by the Fed, but it also looks at government or fiscal spending response. That total of the two of 9.5 trillion, let's do the math on that. Most estimates for 2020 of economic contraction are about 5% for the full calendar year. 5% on a $20 trillion economy is about a trillion dollars, right? Well, 5% on 20? 5% on, on 20, right? Yes. Right, right, right. So, yep. So, so a trillion dollar contraction yep. answered so far by north of $10 trillion in stimulus right. uh, with another what, one and a half to three uh, potentially coming uh, down the pike. So, yeah. so that, that is definitely, again, very, very conducive, probably to the next 12 months, assuming they get a deal done. Um, but yeah, this is, this is the number one driver. And I, I, I just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna breeze through a couple of these other charts, Joe, because I just, I just wanna, again, give historical perspective on what we've seen here. Look at the policy response here in red in 2020 versus where we were in the financial crisis. This is the fiscal policy response. Just, you know, when you look at this in, in magnitude, the A, the swiftness of it, B, the size of it, and, and you look at the monetary response here in 2008. So again, toggling back and forth, the, the, the nine times the response, uh, and, and certainly done quicker. And again, the same thing with the, the Fed balance sheet growth, that's about tri triple the response also in a shorter time period as well. You're, you're looking at massive amounts of support, which is absolutely supportive of the market. And we'll have to wait and see if we get more and, and, and what that would end up doing to continue to support the stock market. And, and if it, heaven forbid, it's able to change investor sentiment with all that cash on the sidelines, it may indicate that we are in for uh, certainly better times ahead, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, you know, I, I thought this was interesting. I, I you know I looked at you know the different the different uh, areas of our economy, and 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 we know that the travel industry has been hit. And if you look at what the food services, the janitors, sales and retail, transport, the, the you know parts of the economy that were hit super hard, and the kind of support that they were getting with the CARES Act, um, goodness, Joe. I mean, thank goodness it was there. But unfortunately, given the fact that that stimulus efforts run out, I'm a little concerned about those areas of the market and the economy holding up. Is are there things that you read into this chart that 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 you see that are that are different or more concerning? No, I mean, well, there's two things. Uh, we 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 collectively, you know, as a country, uh, uh, funneled more money uh, than a hundred percent earnings replacement uh, to these industries. Yeah. So. Again, very, very much poured stimulus. Um, the fall off in, in, in uh, July, on July 31st, of those benefits, very concerning. I totally agree. Uh, ultimately, politicians like to keep their jobs. Uh, so we, we you know, are signing a rare, very strong likelihood to uh, additional stimulus. But at this point, it's definitely a post-election. It's looking, I shouldn't say definitely, but it's very much looking like a post-election um, you know, outcome. Yeah, again, we're, yeah, I mean, there's just, there's just a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. So why don't we, why don't we keep cycling forward? I'm going to go through a couple of different slides here, Joe, on economic data. And, and there's, listen, we could do an hour on just these next couple of slides, but let's, let's, for the benefit of time, get, we'll find a way to work through them quick. This is the amount of debt. And I think that people have problems with the relative amount of debt and indebtedness that they see because uh, it is, it is, it is incredible. Um, certainly, the amount of corporate debt gets a lot of press. The amount of government debt at about 27 trillion gets a lot of press. Um, what what I find interesting here, it, listen, every single chart I find interesting here. Um, you know, I'm seeing imp improvements in certain parts of household debt, which has been great. Uh, I don't see any kind of parabolic numbers here in household debt that give me any cause for alarm. In the amount of money that it takes to service the debt 
Uh, this is from the Congressional Budget Office. I find this interesting because interest rates are so low, Joe, that the cost to service this debt actually is projected to go down uh, for the for the majority of this decade uh, until it turns the corner at some part later later on. And that gives us a little bit of time for us to figure out a plan forward. So for those people that are calling out for, we have too much debt, the, the interest alone on what we're gonna have to pay to continue to have that debt is gonna be outrageous. It seems not so to be the case given just how low interest rates are with a two year treasury at a, you know 14 basis points and a 10 year treasury at 70 something. Um, and, and, and I've seen you know, things like monthly retail sales, which you talked about, I've seen, you've seen this rebound and the numbers here continue to look better. And, uh, you know, Joe, I'm seeing the same picture, even from the global growth of the economy, the global economy continues to grow as well. So from a debt picture to what I'm seeing on the, you know, from the global economic recovery, each one of those pieces continues to look good. So for all the negative things that we've talked about, lots of this economic data looks very favorable to me. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of it comes back to stimulus. So whether U.S. Uh, the U.S. economy, the trajectory of it, uh, Asian economies are the chart that you have on the screen here, overwhelmingly driven by China, uh, which is showing really, really strong credit and fiscal uh, stimulus uh, impulses, uh, social financing, things of that sort. So China leading the way uh, for emerging markets in Asia. And China is obviously the world's second largest economy, so it means something very much. And then Europe, uh, you know, Europe definitely is, I think, it just near term here experiencing a bit more of a COVID uh, second or some people would say third wave. So I think there's some concerns a little bit uh, swirling here in, in Europe right now, but it too definitely rebounded, particularly on the manufacturing side, just like we did in the US, just, just like they did in China. So overall, the gl global growth uh, pulse right now, uh, we view as, as relatively constructive, more so on the manufacturing side than the services side. And that's because services in whole, and this is just logical or intuitive, they've been more impacted by COVID. Uh, so um, it, it's somewhat intuitive from that perspective. Uh, yeah. And I, I, I think that that's uh, listen, that, that's what makes sense. It's just, you know, we're a service-based economy. So a lot of people get caught up in that. I, I, um, we have to do a little. We have to do a little bit on on you know the Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Amazon. We have to do a little note there, and it's important because just those few holdings have such a disproportionate impact on the indexes that people continue to get lulled to sleep. And I, I uh, one one of the things that that you know that we collectively have have done and employed is we we employed the S and P five hundred equal weight index. Which was, you know, great timing. Thank, thank goodness, uh, that trade seems to be working out terrifically because there was such a disproportionate move in just a, the the few very largest companies in the index. Which I'll, I'll put the chart up here in a second just to show you. And 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 and, and there's just such there's so many areas of the market that haven't participated in this rally. It's really astonishing. But mm -hmm. I think this chart tells me what I need to know. Um, if you're looking at you know January 2015 all the way through to 2020, this is this is your Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google. These are these are your, your fan mag, and in this move, just even from the COVID low, is even more exceptional. But you compare that to the S and P 500, and and and, and it, it's it's a world apart, Joe. You know since 2015, those those five companies, uh, six companies, have more than tripled. Where you know, the market's done fine in its own right, and it's up a net aggregate, let's call it 50%. Um, we just haven't seen the participation that's been broad. Um, the question on many's mind is like, oh my, you know, how much longer can this continue? Because I do understand that in, in, in the type of economy that we're moving to, when we have more teams meetings, more people staying at home, uh, favoring Netflix, again, the first favoring Microsoft, um, again, Google and Apple and even Facebook, all those things work well with stay at home. They all work well with technology. They all seem very invincible. So it's, at some point, Joe, does this, are we going to break this trend? Because it's been going on for quite some time. Yeah, this is this this market dynamic. And you, you said several things there. The concentration of the S&P 500 is the standard cap weighted uh, S&P 500, the published you know Vanguard index. Yeah. Uh, which, which we've used, obviously, in your models uh, since we started working together. Um, 
the concentration is is uh, multi-decade highs. So you have to go actually all the way back to the 1950s when IBM was emerging to see this right. level of top heaviness in, in the S&P 500. So that you may want this stuff. chart too, Joe, by the way. This this may help you here. Okay. The, va the growth there versus value indicator. I think this is what you're this is what you're referring to. This the degree is, this is to which growth is being favored. A absolutely. Because the top heavy names in the S&P 500 the Facebooks, the Apples, the Amazons are definitely growth names, growth oriented names, uh, whereas the value oriented names, uh, more cyclicals, industrials, materials, uh, sectors like that um, are highly, highly undervalued. This chart is phenomenal. I mean, it absolutely screams overbought growth and underbought or very cheap value to historic proportions, proportions even greater than the tech bubble back in 99. Right. So, so yes, extremely top heavy market, you know, COVID benefactors were Facebook and Amazon. We need to just think about that and remind ourselves of that. The valuations of those stocks also are something that had us a bit concerned and you referenced, we moved your portfolios, Michael, into an equal weight S&P, which eliminates that top heavy nature still owns the stocks, but it owns everything the same, same percentage, 500 names divided by 500. So that eliminates that top heavy nature. Um, and we did that back, I can't remember, late August uh, 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 timeframe. Uh, so those sorts of things, the technology, the big tech names from here forward, if there's a lot of air in the balloon, there's more likelihood of when the market becomes volatile, for that air to come out of those pockets. Right. So that's, that it's again, it's sort of an intuitive. So if you see volatility forward looking in the market, which you and I are in sync that there's a potential for volatility, certainly you, you need to be a little cautious with those bigger balloons that are holding more air. So backing away from those and diversifying your exposure, I think is smart. I think, and again, we'll talk elections in, in a little bit, I'm sure, but there are definitely some political and tax policy concerns surrounding the big tech names as well that one yeah sure you know so. and i can't wait joe i listen i have a we have all all different kinds of clients but i do have a few clients that own big positions in just a couple of those companies and they're feeling really good about themselves not that i wish ill on anyone and i hope that everyone makes a ton of money that's listening in we want to give good advice and guidance and we're happy to help but at some point, Joe, you got to diversify those holdings because, because man, they will not go up forever, certainly the way that they have been. Um, and Joe, it's time for the election special. We, it occurs to me right now we need music or graphics, but I just have a slide that says election special. Uh, it's time. So yeah, we're, let's go ahead and do this. And, so, and some folks are just tuning in thinking this whole thing's going to be about the election. It's critically important that we understand uh, where we are from a historical perspective, to gain a greater understanding for what we can expect the market to do given a variety of different political outcomes. So uh, this goes without saying, but I'll mention it. Uh, I've, I've mentioned it before, I'll mention it again. Uh, we're, we're, this is not about uh, who to vote for. This isn't about a, a political stance. This is, this is data-driven, economics-focused um, analysis. So this chart, uh, as, we, as we're seeking to understand uh, Trump's re-election likelihood starts to shed light on on some of the concerns that that those who are in the Trump re-election campaign, who are who are who, again they're getting the data that doesn't look particularly favorable. You know, we you know we tend to look at predict it a lot, which as of this moment has them 16 points or so behind Biden. Um, and and when you look historically from Herbert Hoover on, again when you get a high unemployment rates. And and you're and you've got a recession that you're that you're you know coming out of you know you can go back since the Great Depression and 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 you, these you, you do not have uh, presidents that are getting reelected that just historically hasn't happened and it doesn't necessarily mean you know Gerald Ford or, or George H W Bush had solid stock market returns during their tenure but given some of these other dynamics Joe. Um, this as a building block, and I think a foundational fulcrum piece of of the data set, doesn't bode well for Trump. Yeah, um, I mean, I have a hard time, just like I did in 2016, uh, to be honest, uh, predicting anything other than uh, from 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 a from a POTUS standpoint, a Biden victory. 
you know, I mean, this, the thing about the, the, there's a lot of differences between 2016 and, and today, uh, polling numbers are, are, are significantly more skewed, uh, to Biden, uh, than they are, uh, than they were to, uh, Hillary Clinton, first of all, uh, the, the, the volatility of her lead relative to the volatility of Biden's lead, right. hers was much, much higher. It, it, yeah. Trump, Trump had leads. Uh, in polling uh, in September, October, uh, he's not been closed. So, so I, I think the, a, a lot of the focus on the presidential election is is one thing, and certainly it's a big. In, uh, we expect it to be a big director of uh, or uh, influencer of market returns, but uh, our read is is that it's actually the outcome of the Senate, right? That is arguably, well, I'm sure we'll get there. That, that's more important actually than the outcome of, uh, of the White House. Yeah, we are. We are going to unpack that, and I. We are going to unpack it. Um, we need to. Well, so so let's let's. There's a, there's a lot of variables, Joe, with regards to this election, and one of them I think is, uh, well, one of them I know is voter turnout. Impossible to know what we're going to see, what it's going to look like. But one of the data points that I saw that I thought was particularly interesting was here, and it showed that there were. You know, in the swing states in particular, you're seeing uh, those states that are being hit with a, a higher percentage of people that are, are are applying for unemployment benefits. Not a, if it's a swing state and they're having a particularly difficult time in the job market just before an election, that's not great. If you look at where COVID cases are peaking, kind of the way to look at this chart, it's a little bit like a Rorschach test. I don't know what object you see, Joe. Maybe you see a smiley face, which would tell me something about your personality. Maybe you don't. I don't know. Maybe if you see a frown, I, I don't know how you see that. But the point is, is that the way that this looks from an eye test perspective is that you can see here in red, the places that Trump needs and wants to win, or won, I should say in 2016, you're seeing a significant COVID presence there. That doesn't bode well either for the electoral process for Trump. Um, I'll get to that in a second. Is there anything you want to add here, Joe? Yeah, I, I would actually. I would. I mean, the big picture here in the presidential election: Biden has roughly a ten-point lead, a blend of the betting markets and the polling uh, averages right. nationally. Mm -hmm. Okay, about a ten-point lead nationally uh, on average. Uh, he also has a four-point lead in the swing states uh, as well. So this is why you know uh, markets are assigning more odds to a Biden victory than a Trump victory. Uh, turnout is something you just mentioned. I think that's something that's really, uh, you know, very important as well. 2018 midterms had the largest turnout since 1970. Uh, and I think a lot of the, uh, think of them what you will, but the personality characteristics and the, and, the, and, the, and the like of the president, I think, are drove a lot of things back in 2018. Mm -hmm. I'd expect something similar today. The one thing that we're already seeing, though, in terms of early voting is also remarkable. The state, yeah. of the state of Texas is already, and the state of Texas has very limited and restricted mail-in and early voting procedures. They're already 20% of the, of the overall total that was voted back in 2016. Vermont is already at 35%. One out of three people have already voted. So there's some real significant kind of early voting running at about a six times normal clip. A lot of this, obviously it's COVID related, but early voting is running at a 6x clip where it has uh, historically, you know, right yeah. now. So. In, you know, the, in the great unknown to me is obviously a reluctant, the reluctant Trump voter or, or someone that doesn't want to vote. Again, someone doesn't want to vote for Trump but ends up doing it. And, and yeah. do you know what a reluctant Trump voter looks like? I actually have no idea. But the point is, is that no one knows what they look like. No one knows. We don't know in, in there. And we will have to find out. We'll have to find out. But I imagine, Joe, that there's a, a, a large number of folks out there, listeners or otherwise, that, you know, are going to vote that way, but would never tell anybody or even admit to it. So we'll have to see. Which is, which is why we and you and anybody anybody who's been watching politics for the last four years knows that whatever these polls say doesn't really mean anything. I know, uh, I know. You know that's very true. Hey, one other thing on the on the presidential election um, that I think is is worth mentioning is that is this notion uh, and possibility of a contested election. 
Um, oh, we got we've got data on that for sure. Yeah, yeah. I was hit it. Okay. What do you want to? I think yeah, no, we got we got to do we're gonna do it. We're gonna do we got to do the contested elections. That that that's got a huge market impact, I think. Which it, we can... it, it absolutely does. I didn't I didn't see a chart on that, but I wanted to make sure. I don't know if you do have something you want to point to. My favorite oh. phrase is I've got a chart on that. That's like my catch line. That's I need a shirt that says I have a chart for that. Of course you no. do. Hey, I know. So, so no, 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 no holiday gift ideas. I'll get my own. But um, so one of the one of the one of the surveys we pay a lot of attention to actually is a Bank of America institutional money manager survey. Yeah. And it it, it the usually we just take away what their cash positioning is to see if it's elevated or, or low. Um, they also ask questions about scenarios in base case scenarios, and it was a 62 percent of respondents, institutional money managers, by the way. Yeah. 62% of respondents had a base case expectation of a contested election. Uh, so that's that's not an encouraging thing from a market perspective. That also would argue that the market has priced that in, however. Uh, yes. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're right. Well, certainly from the retail money market, plus the inst B of A institutional survey added those two components together. And you've got, you've got something that makes that case, I think, really well. Um, I, I want. I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, very, very briefly, kind of, you know, the political uncertainty that we're living in right now. I, listen, this is. I'm not going to soapbox any of this because, again, all of this is done with a financial tilt. But, but let's just let's just look at where we are now versus where we were. We were in a place 40 years ago. Again, this is the, starting the baby boom generation. Demographics were very much in our favor. We had falling interest rates coming off of very high inflation. We were just entering a real globalization period where the cost of goods and services were lowered or lowering sequentially as more businesses were doing um, additional manufacturing or services offshore to, 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 to reduce the cost of, of, of what it is that they were producing. More automation, again, driving the cost of things down. That's where we were. The market looked great. We had a couple of really great decades the fulcrum here is 2000. Again, that, that birth and explosion of the internet. And it, it, what it marked is that, you know, rates have been getting, again, in a place where now we're at bo bottom of the barrel, uh, low interest rates. Demographics are tougher in that we, yes, we do have the millennials on one hand, but where the bulk of the money is still is with the baby boomers. So to some degree, we have demographics working against us. Uh, in, in, in a large, in, in, you know, in large concentration. And we have an anti-globalization uh, and populist approach towards our economic system that is not uh, conducive with rapid growth. And, and we've got lots of debt, which we covered earlier, you know, both corporate, um, uh, governmental, and even to some degrees on an individual side, although on the individual side, that level of debt looks very sustainable. But when you're dealing with these different sets of criteria versus where we were in the 80s, I don't want to conflate the two things because I have some people kind of hoping that we'll have a return to Reaganism in, in, in terms of where we will be economically. And it's tough. And, and, and as a result, we've got this high political uncertainty. So I think that, Joe, I think that what I want to let people know is that we're aware of the demographic changes and, and all the other sequential changes that we've talked about that have put our economy in a different position than we've been in in decades. It's led to high political uncertainty as measured here. You can see where we, where we you know, again, this is COVID, but we have super high political uncertainty, far more than we did in 2008. But what's nice is that even through and with all that political uncertainty and even with all those challenges, it looks like, Joe, uh, that tends to lead to higher market returns. <laughs> How do we put? How do you put all that together? Well, I mean, high policy uncertainty leads to market volatility. I mean, the, the peak of policy uncertainty was March of 2020. Right. And think of the March of 2020 through September, October of 2020 returns. Yep. Nosebleed returns. So, yeah. so yes, policy uncertainty correlates with with market. Un, you know, uh, policy uncertainty correlates with market volatility, which correlates with attractive forward returns from that point forward. Uh, one thing I'll mention, I think that last slide you're on is, which is really important and it plays into what you're doing uh, from your investment program uh, specifically. All those things, low rates, uh, 
higher levels, particularly of government debt, declining demographics, and an anti-growth populism, anti-globalization movement. That is definitely an anti-growth uh, 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 cocktail. So, so all those things, what do they mean? And, and, we, and you know we work with a lot of institutional clients, so pension funds, endowments, and the like. What this really means, it's not, those don't add up to a friendly environment from a secular perspective, a long, long-term perspective for a simple 60-40 portfolio. Right. And the, re the reason is that the 40% you have in bonds isn't yielding 5% like it was in normal times. It's yielding 1%. So you don't get contribution from fixed income. You have volatility and declining or deteriorating aspects, those other three boxes. So it does beg uh, or make a case, I should say, for arguably some more tactical management of your program, of your, of your investments uh, and the likes, because it does not mean you can't do well, but it does make a pretty strong case that a buy and hold 60-40 approach might fall short of expectations, that's all. Yeah, and in, uh, case, in case you missed it, just, Joe just predicted the death of Vanguard. I'm joking, I'm joking, you didn't. You did well, but, I, didn't but, say, I didn't say death of indexing, I said I death know, of- I know, you said closet right. indexing. And so, right, to your point, Joe, we, 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 yeah. make, we make a concerted effort to have our portfolios focus on parts of the market that are working. We're looking for where the momentum is, where the opportunities are, and always trying to refresh the portfolio to capture value. Joe, did you see this morning the note on um, Chewy.com? You know, one, one of the positions that we enacted probably, again, it's probably six or seven or eight weeks ago, was that pet index. And we took a pretty significant position. It's actually one of our like 25 largest holdings, by the way, and across across our organization. And and it's not that I'm not right. This is not a recommendation. So do not take this as a recommendation. This is not, so don't go out and buy it. But if you're our client, I'm just letting you know a little tidbit. But that got, there was a really great note. Chewy was up about five and a half percent today because they were acknowledging the fact that through COVID, pet ownership was spiking. But, but through, you know, good quality, thoughtful research, in, in forward thinking and, and continually having a portfolio that looks ahead, that's that's how we're able to do it. That's how we do what we do. And it's not just that 60-40 portfolio that's not moving. There's a lot of thought in it. And those kind of moves uh, make a huge difference. So I thought I'd point that. All right, Joe shaking his head yes. He wants me to go on. All right. So um, I, I want to point out, there's too much to point out with the Biden presidency, but can we just do taxes for a second, Joe? People freak out about the taxes, and and uh, there are moments where I'm one of them. I'm, I'll be I'll be honest. You start to do the math in your head um, about what Biden is proposing, and then you and then you look at it from a historical context. Here, the amount of tax increases that Biden's proposing, and he even said Biden did last night in his own uh, town hall, uh, not debate, town hall discussion, was that. Well, we'll have to see what tax uh, taxes he's going to be able to implement. But if Biden had his way, the total tax increase would be, as a percentage of GDP, seeks to be the second largest in our country's history and just significantly larger than we've seen in many, many, many decades. Um, and, and it's going to come in the form of higher corporate tax here in blue, higher payroll tax, higher small business tax, higher cap gains tax. Uh, and potentially something with a state ca tax carryover. So, you know, we, we have to, I think, Joe, we need to acknowledge the fact that those higher taxes, particularly on put on the lap of corporations, has to hurt their corporate profitability if it were to happen to some fairly significant degree. I think the question is, is that do those tax increases that are being proposed under a Biden, a Biden administration, can, could they possibly be offset by additional government intervention, whether it be in the form of additional stimulus or infrastructure spending? And is that the right way to handicap this whole thing, Joe? Yeah, well, that's that's what the market is, is uh, market action, I think, is referring to right now. I think this, this is it's interesting. If you asked me uh, a, a month and a half ago how the markets would be reacting to 
an increasing likelihood of a Biden win and a Democratic sweep, um, I would have said negatively. Um, but I think the market really is starting to get its hands around and, and quantify. In fact, the last chart you had up does quantify it. That the, the overall tax package equates to about a 10% hit to earnings, corporate yeah. earnings. So, so you should expect roughly a 10, or this, uh, this chart says 12% to after tax income. That's 10% right. roughly to EBITDA. So, so uh, I mean, a 10% hit to corporate earnings, a negative. Increased regulation is probably a negative at the margin as well. Yeah. I think much less so on the financials. Financials really aren't batting an eye uh, relative to a Biden expectation. Uh, just because the financials have been living with Dodd-Frank for a decade already, and I think they're more at the margin regulations coming from that perspective. Healthcare regulation is something definitely that's that's on the radar, some negative connotations from healthcare. But there is a positive side of the ledger with a democratic sweep, which it seems the market is sinking its teeth into a little more so, certainly over the last you know four to six weeks, which is which are things like uh, much uh, vastly improved uh, trade relations uh, with China, vastly uh, reduced trade conflict expectations uh, with Europe. Uh, so that stability is going to reduce uncertainty, number one. Number two is elimination of tariffs. Uh, the elimination of tariffs is a very positive thing that is expected under a Biden or a Democratic sweep uh, scenario. And the last and overwhelmingly most important, we're beating the dead horse, is a D-sweep likely translates to north of $3 trillion in fiscal stimulus, plus a $600 billion infrastructure package that is making markets very happy for the next 12 months. Longer term implications are a whole other conversation, uh, but, but that's what really I think market action is, is, is how it's pricing in the election outcome. So yes, tax is a big concern, but there's another side of the ledger. Yeah, and, and the one thing, and you, and you mentioned it, Joe, but I just wanted to kind of put a different lens on it a bit. And, and I don't think it gets enough discussion is what th there, there, is a, there is at least a high likelihood, I think the market believes it, and, and to me it makes good fundamental sense that a Biden administration means that there's different relations with China, different, more positive relations with China. And in the amount of additional business that we would be able to be, we would be able to secure with a, with a, a strong relationship with China and how many businesses that impacts. I think there's also another tailwind just specific to China alone, again, better trade relations worldwide, but specific to China, I just think that there's some, some, some positive room to be made up um, right there. A um, couple, of, couple of charts here just to show, I can breeze through these ones. Um, historically, neither party's had a political has had an edge. So the rate, rate of return average is, is, is both 9% plus a little bit for both Republicans and Democrats. Those that are strong Republicans don't believe this chart. Those that are strong Democrats, they feel they feel the glory that 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 uh, that they that economically things do well. Um, where I Joe, where, where we discussed this earlier, and we're bringing it back to that briefly is, is that divided government. And this is kind of that D sweep argument. Divided government tends to be a higher performing stock market with an average rate of return of 10. In a unified government, the average rate of return of 8.2. That's a significant difference, especially to a 2% return differential over a four year period of time. That's meaningful. Um, so, is there any, I'm sure, is there more that you wanted to unpack with that? One thing, one thing. Uh, historically, gridlock is good. That's yeah. what that last chart said. It, historically, and it's very true. Uh, we, in, in, of, the, of the various election outcome scenarios, the one that does have us a bit concerned actually is gridlock. And it's a form of a Biden White House, a Republican Senate blocking fiscal stimulus, yeah. potentially, which is what happened. And the reason I say that is because that's what happened back in 2011 uh, when the Republicans took control of the Senate. Uh, made it very difficult for um, uh, any sort of stimulative efforts really to get pushed through uh, more fiscally conservative uh, momentum back then. Now, the Republicans haven't been nearly as fiscally conservative, but there is definitely uh, obviously more of a DNA for that uh, in the Republican Party than the Democratic Party, certainly. So that is a, that is a risk. In fact, a, a bank credit analyst, one of the research engines we really look to, is forecasting only about a $500 billion stimulus package with a Democratic White House Republican Senate. 
And that probably disappoints markets uh, materially. So, uh, you know, yeah, that's worth mentioning. Yeah, it's funny, but since, since when did 500 billion? It was like a 500 billion, that's all you got? Um, it's, 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 you know, what a difference a few years makes. Uh, so we can speed through a couple of these very, very, very important charts. So Joe and I have continued to hit home the point that the, all this government spending is stimulative to the economy. It is also stimulative to the stock market. You can go back to 1930. This chart says it clear. When you're running a large deficit, the average rate of return of the market was running 15.2. When you have a surplus to a small deficit, not as much government spending, the rate of return of the market's less than half. It's less than half. I mean, so it, 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 you know, look no further than the fact that you can see, if you look at the CBO estimates, as I have here in the chart, you'll see that there it looks to be continued significant government spending, which is also, again, to the previous chart's point, very beneficial and helpful to the stock market, um, which leads us to you know, one of the final points here, Joe, and that is the election chaos. Um, this is this is the data. This is the, the moment where we talk about if we don't if we do have a contested election, um, what happens? And, and when we look from a historical context, if we do have legal challenges, which is kind of this baseline case here in, in, in yellow, you, you look back to the hanging Chad uh, election in Florida in the year 2000, um, 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 you know, Gore versus Bush. And at that time, you know, the market dropped about 11 and percent in a three week period of time. So the base case is if there is no clear winner in November, what we're seeing as an expected rate of return is we're looking at maybe a negative 10 for the S&P 500, a negative 12 for the NASDAQ potentially. And, and you know, or, you know, on the flip side is that if there is, if the, if the polling numbers and if the predicted numbers are accurate and you do get a clear, concise, decisive victory, in this case, it would likely, as the data indicates, to favored Biden, then the market may respond positively to that. Again, this is given historical context because there is this general sense of fear that it will be a contested election. And then if that, if that indeed happens, you get that clean result, the expect, expectation is the market rolling up five and the NASDAQ rolling up seven. So, I mean, of course, there's the bad case where there's the surprise on taxes. I, we, that data is here, Joe. I don't know if we need to go over it, but between the contested election or things being done on a very certain basis, you know, I, I think we can we can look fairly reliably to the to the past to gain a greater sense for what what we may be looking for towards the future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's a, I mean, it's a set and wait. It's a set and wait situation. November third, November fourth. Get a read for what thing what the landscape looks like. And yeah, I mean, any the, the thing about it though, I mean, any any uh, significant dip uh, right at or shortly following the election. We likely, depending on the environment at the time, of course, but we likely view it as a buy the dip, uh, depending on what the tea leaves look like. Because if we do see meaningful stimulus in 2021 is a high likelihood, we will view a dip in November as a buying opportunity or a buy Absolutely. the dip Absolutely, so, 100%. Yeah. I mean, that's, and we try to, and we try to buy dips as much as we can. <laughs> We just, you know, in, in general, and I'll, I'll, I'll probably close with something like that. Um, real, real briefly, Joe, this is not perfect for everyone. Do not copy and paste this information and do not. This is not blanket investment advice. Is that enough of a disclaimer? I hope so. Um, if Trump were to win, there are some areas of the market that we would look at more favorably. With a Biden win, it's certainly going to be the thought about infrastructure spending. You're looking at building, building materials and construction. There are some areas of the market that we might seek to avoid with a Biden win. Again, we're going to have to wait and see how things shape up. But this is how, to how we see things coming together right now as we sit here, just to give everyone an idea of the fact that, yes, we are aware that not all areas of the market are going to respond accordingly, which again folds into the what we had discussed earlier with the fact that this is why kind of that closet indexing approach we feel like in particular now more than ever doesn't really work well since certain areas of the market are going to respond differently to the economic environment. But Joe, on a big picture, Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, Carter, Bush, Obama, Trump, you name it, you got blues, you've got reds, the market the market does what the market does. I, I know we spent a lot of time on the election, and I know it has 
an impact on what we're doing, but the market still is fundamentally made up of company profits and companies doing well year after year and doing better. So I know that the election is going to have some imp impact and implications. I get that. But from an economic perspective, what people should look to us for is finding opportunities, keeping you invested because red or blue, the economy moves on. The economy moves on, the stock market tends to move onward and upward uh, together. So uh, that's, that's, where, that's where things go, irregardless of election outcomes. A lot of things to, to evaluate in portfolios that you, I know, uh, manage and manage well, uh, Michael. So uh, that's, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's, uh, that sums it up pretty well. Yeah. Way longer than we wanted. I had a I knew I knew it would be. And uh, so for those of you listening to this in two parts, uh, thanks for making it all the way through. If you listen to it in one and you, and you hear my voice, you stayed awake through the whole thing. This is an achievement. So well done. You you should you, we should be giving out credits like CE credits for this. This is like an economics class, a finance class all rolled into one. Joe, you're amazing as always. Um, uh, thank you so much for everything. If you guys have any questions, reach out, let us know. We're here. Email, call, whatever it might be. Don't follow my investment advice specifically in here. Don't be making trades based upon what I said without talking to me first. Another disclosure. Uh, thanks again so much. Uh, take care, everyone. Material on this program is intended for general information only and should not be taken as specific investment, tax, or legal advice. None of the information contained in this broadcast is intended by the host to be a solicitation for sale of any security. Further information is available by contacting Henry and Horn Wealth Management. Securities offered through Independent Financial Group, member of FINRA SIPC. Advisory services offered through Wealth Management LLC, DBA Henry and Horn Wealth Management, a registered investment advisor. Henry and Horn Wealth Management and IFG are separate and unrelated entities. Henry and Horn and Henry and Horn Wealth Management are separate entities. Member of FINRA and SIPC.